Hello and welcome to Pearson Speaking About Pedagogy and Practice in English featured speaker series. I'm Jennifer Edwards with the marketing team and I'm glad you could join us today. I hope that you find the ideas being presented by our speaker Kathleen McWhorter valuable for your classroom teaching. For those of you who are new to the webinar format, I have a few quick things to point out before our session begins. If you're calling in by phone, please know that this is not a toll-free number. For that reason, we recommend that you select Use Mic and Speakers in the control bar so you can listen toll-free through your computer speakers. You may have noticed that your line has also been muted. This is to minimize background noise or any interruptions to the presentation. We encourage you to ask questions by typing in the text box marked Questions on the right-hand side of your screen in the webinar dashboard. If your dashboard seems to have disappeared, hit the orange arrow and it will open back up. You can send us your questions at any point, and when the formal presentation is over, we'll be using the remaining time to pose as many of your questions as possible to our speaker. Any questions we don't get to will be forwarded to Kathleen along with your email address so that all questions will be answered one way or another. Please include your name and school at the beginning of your question. We would also like to invite you to keep up with this conversation on Twitter. To do that, you can follow us at PearsonNorthAM and use the hashtag PearsonLearn. Today's session is titled, A Scaffolded Approach to Teaching Integrated Reading and Writing by Kathleen McWhorter. Dr. Kathleen McWhorter is the author of more than a dozen reading, writing, and integrated reading and writing textbooks designed to help students succeed in college. She has over 34 years of teaching experience in both two- and four-year colleges and is currently devoting most of her time to developing materials for integrated reading and writing courses. All right, Kathleen, are you ready to get started? I am. Excellent. Thank you for joining me. Uh, before we begin, I have to uh, caution you about a couple of things. First, I'm working in my home office, and I have um, two golden retrievers working right here with me. They promised not to bark, since I told them this is an important webinar, but they might not listen, and all bets are definitely off if you hear the doorbell or if they spot a rabbit in the yard. So you might hear them. Please bear with that. And the other thing you need to know about me is that I'm electronically jinxed. My friends at Pearson, I'm sure, can attest to that one. Um, it's so bad, actually, that my son-in-law, my, also my go-to tech guy, says, quote, if, this is, if it's electronic and she touches it, it's going to be trouble. And so I'm taking steps to avert that. So I've asked my editor, Jill Cook, to join with me in this session today. She'll help me with the screen, but more importantly, she can contribute a lot to our discussion and to the presentation. Jill and I have worked together for 15 years on all of my books, so don't be surprised if we even complete each other's sentences. Jill, can you say hello so we know you're there? Hi, everybody. This is Jill Cook. Uh, as Kathleen said, we've been working together for many, many years on all of her books, and we do often think the same thing and say the same thing at the same <laughs> time, but we'll try and say different things as we do this presentation. Thank you. Okay, let's get started. Uh, let's think first about where we are today with Integrated Reading and Writing, IRW for short. Um, it's new to most of us. We're all trying to figure it out. Uh, it's not something a lot of us chose, but it's our job now. And actually, I think it's turning out quite well. I'm, I'm pretty pleased. I'm excited about it. Uh, some of us are just beginning. Others of you have had, I'm sure, a lot of experience with it, a few years or maybe more. I think most of us are still tweaking it, working, finding out what works and what doesn't work, and working to make things that seem OK even better. Uh, we're experimenting. We're sharing results. I don't think anybody has all the answers yet. I want to assure you that I don't. Uh, but what I'd like to do this afternoon is to share with you one approach that I found works well in meeting the challenges we face as we teach IRW. So I've picked out uh, four challenges. There's many more. but. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with these, so we won't dwell on this, but we all know we've got a compressed, compressed time frame. 15 weeks has shrunk to eight in some cases. Uh, that's one problem. And there's fewer level courses. I remember back when there were four levels of reading courses and two to three levels of writing courses. Now they're combined, and we have fewer levels. So we have to move students along faster, and we have less instructional time. Uh, Due to the fact that we've got fewer courses, we've got a wider range of skill levels of students in our classes. Um, 
that makes it harder to teach. And we have two risks in a wide range skill level class. One is we leave the weaker students behind, or we don't challenge the more advanced ones. So there's the problem, um, but we're looking for solutions, so we'll move on here. And then given these three challenges, then we need to think about scaffolding. Uh, availability of materials. Um, what I'm going to try to do is show you an approach to tie Sorry. together. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, we're, we're together now. What is, so I'm going to show you how to use scaffolding. Let's define scaffolding. Um, it's a teaching strategy, and it, it moves students progressively and sequentially uh, toward improved reading and writing. And the key words here are sequential and progressive. Uh, think of scaffolding next to a building, just a regular old metal thing sitting next to a building. It's a structure that enables workers to climb or reach toward higher heights on the building. Well, I'm going to try to show you how to progressively and gradually move students to new heights up the building, so to speak, toward better reading and writing. So how does scaffolding work? What does it do? I've got three bullet uh, points for you on the screen there. Um, it moves students from simple to complex. I think we all do that to extent in our classroom. Um, an example, we start with sentence and paragraph writing, we move to more complex essay writing. Uh, in reading, we use uh, easy vocabulary and then move to more difficult. We start with literal, factual questions and move to critical thinking. Um, so we, that's one aspect. The second aspect is more, more help to less help, more guidance to, to less. Um, I think we do this all, to an extent already, but let's do it consciously and deliberately and sequentially. Um, an example might be paraphrasing. If you're not giving a student any help, we would just say, here's what a para paraphrase is, here's a sample one, go do one. That's giving them, that's no help at all. To provide some help, we could show them one, tell them how to do it, and then give them a partially complete one. That's giving the students some guidance. And then after they've filled in the partially complete one, help them write their own. So that's what I mean by from guided to independent learning. And we want to move students from low to high stakes writing. We want to have them start with sentence writing if, if they need to, move on to paragraphs, move to essays, and the kind of writing they're doing needs to progress from summary writing to essay writing to perhaps documented papers. So let's look, I'd like to show you then today, and this is really the bulk of my presentation, is a demonstration of scaffolding. So I have chosen three levels. These are kind of arbitrary. Um, have you ever watched Rachel Ray on the Food Network? Uh, she can show you how to cook a chicken three different ways in 23 minutes. Well, I'm going to try to do the same thing with, with one reading. I'm going to show you how to use a single reading and adapt it three different ways to suit students at different points in the reading and learning process. Can't guarantee the 23 minute part though. Um, but level one, as you can see on the screen here, um, we're starting at probably at the beginning of the term, but although it, it, it could be uh, earlier or later, uh, focus on literal and paragraph writing. And then we move to the second level, uh, focus on critical thinking and essay writing. You can see me gradually progressing, and you can see a sequential nature here. And then may, perhaps toward the end of the term, uh, more focus on for reading, evaluation, and analysis, and response writing. So let's look. What I've prepared for you here is, and this is really a, my Word file. Um, and let me give you a couple of, uh, so I'm going to work through the reading three different ways, like three different chicken dishes. And you're going to see, um, first you're going to see me using level one, which is now level one is again the emphasis on literal reading and paragraph writing. It's bare bones, literal. Who did what, when and where is what I'm working with from the reading perspective. For, from the writing perspective, what I'm working on is sentence writing and very basic paragraph writing. Now, this is what I'm going to have. I've got some apparatus here and later on the screen you'll see that there's a a piece of a reading here. I'm not even going to put the whole reading up here. That's not important. What I'm showing you right now is what you would do before you present the reading to a student. 
I think I'd like to caution you, though, that the reading here is not what you're really teaching. It's hard to realize that, but it isn't. The reading that we're using here is, is a brother loss, as you can see at the top. But it's easy to think we're teaching that reading, but we're not. We're teaching the process that a student goes through in reading this reading and writing about it. You know, I have a literature background. I know Jill does. I'm, I suspect many of you do as well. In literature, what we want to do is teach the poem. It's valuable. It has intrinsic value. We like it. We want our students to like it. And we're teaching it. But here we're not. This brother lost. It's a competent reading. It's, perhaps some, maybe you could even argue it's literature. We don't need to go down that road, though. But um, it's really not what we're teaching. What we're teaching is how to go about reading so they can read anything they need to in a textbook, in an English class, later on the job. So <clears throat> let me walk you through what I would do um, with a reading. The, my goal here is to show you how you can develop materials like this for your own students. Now, this is level one. Go ahead, Jill. Kathleen, I, can, I just jump in here for a second. We're going to, Kathleen's going to use this reading, the same reading, each time to show how you could take one reading and teach skills at different levels, scaffold and build the skills, as she just explained, from a level one, which is a focus on literal reading and paragraph writing, through to the more, the, the higher level critical thinking skills. So you'll see the title um, repeated each time we go to a different level, but we're showing how you can use the same material in different ways to build on basic skills. Great. Thank you, Jill. Um, so let me start them. First of all, I think the very first time I showed a student a level one reading, I would work through it with them. I would work with it in class. I'd have it up on a screen, and I would start right in. And I'd, first of all, I'd point out the head note to them. Uh, students tend to skip it. I think we do, too. Um, what we want to explain to explain students why they should look at that. Uh, we don't care about this particular head note. We want them to get in the habit of reading head notes. Uh, you need to explain to them that it provides a focus. And we know it gets students' mind on the reading and off of whatever they're doing, the last text message they sent or something. So we want them to, to, to look at that and point out the value of it. And then I've got steps here. Step one. Students need to preview, and I would walk them through it. In fact, I might put the whole reading up on a screen, and I would highlight as I'm reading so they could see exactly the parts of a reading that they need to preview. And I think they need to know the benefits. Uh, it tells them what to expect. It makes reading easier. They'll buy it for those two reasons. And then after they've previewed, I think it's very important that students connect to their own experience. I think this is important at all levels. So you will see that these two steps are going to stay in all three versions of uh, my reading. Um, here I'm just asking questions. You notice that they're just questions. I don't tell them what to do with it. I think here in step two, what we want to do is talk. I think students need to talk about it, to hear each other thinking about the reading, explain the value of it. Uh, later on, you'll see that I do different things with, with step two. Now, then on to the reading, the reading tip. I think students need as much help as we can give them. And I like to give them tips. I like them to feel like I'm on their side and I'm going to help them as much as I can. And so in, I, offer, I like to offer a reading tip before they start. Uh, the tip might explain the value of the reading to the students. It might uh, tell them what to look for. In other readings, it might give them advice on what, how to read it. It might warn them of pitfalls. There's, there's difficult vocabulary in this. It's filled with technical vocabulary. Here's what you do. So I like to give them, and I, I talk with them about it rather than just let them read it. So and then what I would next have them do is, here's, the, here's just a brief excerpt of the reading. Um, we didn't print it all here because you really don't need it um, now. And yeah, now let me ask you, please don't try as we go through the the apparatus now that follows the reading. Please don't try to read all the questions. There's too many of them. Um, and 
I didn't put as many as I would use either. Now, right after finishing the reading, the first uh, section here is, is building vocabulary using context. Um, I have only two items up here. I probably would have at this level one maybe eight or ten. Uh, this is just for your convenience and, and ours that we don't bore you with seeing too many things here. Notice that, back to scaffolding, notice that it's multiple choice. Multiple choice is recognition of the right answer. That's the easiest. That's giving them the most support. Um, the words I choose will differ here. I'm going to, in level one, I'm going to choose words that the, um, the context clue for the meaning of the word is pretty obvious. You almost can't miss it. It hits you in the face. That's what I want. So I want them to know how easy context can be and how helpful it can be. Later, I'll change that. I'll make them harder. Uh, you'll see that. And now moving on, word parts. Um, again, notice that it's fill in the blank here. I'm, I've given them the meaning of the word parts. I'm using some words from the passage. Uh, fill in the blank. Again, more, the most support that I can think to give them. So and I think, move. go ahead. And I think also, Kathleen, that um, we've thought that it, it's useful to use context, to teach context first, even at the lowest level, to try and help students find the meaning of a word whilst they're reading. So that's, that's another part of the scaffolding, is to teach that skill first, or to practice that skill first, and then go to using word parts, which um, is another strategy for students to use if context doesn't work for them, to then try and look at the, the word and break out the parts to understand meaning. Yeah, I think, too, that with both parts of vocabulary here, um, you know, we're really not teaching these particular words. I don't really care if the student ever knows what antipsychotic means, but what I do care about is that the student can figure out words that begin with prefixes and have roots. So it's the process. So when you work with a student on this, it's not so much what does antipsychotic mean. It's more of how did you figure it out. And the same with context. If you see a clue, how did it work? How did you find it? What did it tell you? What do you know now that you didn't before? So again, I'm focusing more on process and not on content. I know that's kind of hard to, to accept, I imagine. but. It will do them no good once they're done with this reading if all they can do is understand this reading. So let's move then to um, thesis and main ideas. Again, there's more, fewer questions here than I would use, but notice they're very literal. Again, multiple choice, offering the most support. Um, I didn't get into implied main ideas, uh, anything else here. This is just the bare bones. And the same with identifying details. And again, in both thesis, main idea, and details, I'm concerned more with how they found the thesis, how they know it is, or how they found the topic of a paragraph, than I am to them that they know exactly what the, the topic of this particular paragraph is. Again, focus on process. Um, same with transitions down further. Um, again, it's very, I didn't go further than transitions and I didn't do very much with them. I think at this level we have to focus more on the global meanings and not on particular words and phrases. So very limited coverage. I might ask a couple more questions than I have here, but I wouldn't dwell on it. I also think thinking visually is an important skill. Um, they need to, to know why the visual is there. Multiple choice, again, to show them um, just at least they need to know. Now, moving then to writing. Um, there's different levels of ways you can respond to a reading, and I've chosen what I think is one of the most basics, basic ones, and that's paraphrasing. And here is the example I used previously about paraphrasing. Some people may look at this and say, well, this is just busy work. They're just looking up words in the, in the passage and putting them in, but really not, I don't think. They have a framework for a paraphrase, and they're going to complete it. So this is, they will then follow through the process of developing a paraphrase with help. And then once I've given them that kind of support, I'm going to move down further, and then I'm going to ask them to create their own um, paraphrase. And they write their own after I've shown them a model. Again, I'm moving from 
more help to less and moving from simpler to more complex. Now my coverage of critical thinking and analysis is limited in, in level one. It, as I said, it's a who did what, when, where approach. I do want them to think about the issue that the reading discusses, so I've asked a couple of questions. I think I might just ask two here. Um, I want them to master the literal before I move full-blown into the critical. So you'll notice the absence of critical thinking questions here. You may be able to move very quickly through level one to get to level two, or you'll see I do more of this. But at the very beginning, especially the first reading I'm doing, I want to be sure that everybody knows what the reading is about and how to find these essential items, vocabulary, main ideas, details, uh, transitions, visuals. I want them to be comfortable with that before I move to anything too, too more complicated. And then the writing here is paragraph. Uh, notice that it's from personal experience. Think of a situation in which you tried. Uh, they're basic questions. You'll see this changes, though. It's low stakes writing now. You'll see a change as we move uh, on in levels. So let's move to uh, level two. Again, same reading, same apparatus. Now here, I'm keeping many of the same things, and they are just on the white screen. What is in this yellow color or beige color is what's new. It's what I've added or changed to move to level two of the scaffold. So I'm leaving the head note and the previewing. In the connecting though, now I've got them writing. You see that they're writing an answer to those questions. I think they're ready for that now. Um, you could, if you wanted to, have them uh, write in step one. I'll, I'm, I'm moving it. I did it with level three, but you could, if, if you felt your class was ready, uh, you could. Uh, the reading tip is, is, is the same here. You could change that if you felt there was enough things you wanted to warn the students about in the reading tip. I left it the same for, for, this, for this situation. And then let's have a look at the apparatus. Context, I changed the words. They're harder. They're different. They're less obvious. And I think I put more of them in. Again, moving from less to more complex. Word parts, same thing. I, I left it as mobile choice here. Uh, you could, if you feel your students are ready, switch them to writing a definition. I chose to do it in level three. Um, thesis and main ideas. I'm now I'm ready for, to talk about implied main ideas with the students. I still think it's important that we we still cover topics and always the thesis, of course. But and again, I probably ask more than one implied main idea question here. I just put one for you to see. Uh, again, we're moving to higher level. Uh, thinking skills now. This is, it, it's inferential to figure out the implied main idea, while the other questions that I've had previously were factual, literal recall. Details, uh, I left them the same. Uh, I might change them if I felt there were less obvious details or secondary details. You could do that if you, if you want. But I was trying not to make this too complicated. So details I didn't do anything with, so it's not highlighted. So now, I'm ready to move on to organizational patterns as I start to think about what glues the, the, the essay together. Transitions will stay, but now it's time to think about organizational patterns. Since it's the first time they're talking about it, I'm talking about it with them, I gave them multiple choice because I, they, they need that support at the beginning. Okay, and then thinking critically, I left that state the same. And now I'm ready to move on to, to critical thinking implied meanings. This is where I'm moving into the critical thinking area. I'm focusing on first the part F is, is, is inference and part G is various critical thinking skills. As we scroll through them you'll see that I'm talking about author's purpose and, and the next uh, tone and supporting evidence uh, interpretation, what does the author mean, agree or disagree with. Uh, item five is connotative meaning. Item six is more interpretation. Uh, seven, interpretation again. I wanted multiple choice though, because again, I think just ask the questions throughout these 
without the multiple choice, I think the students would, they would flounder. What happens when I do this with students who don't really have the background and the skills, is they, their answers are vague, they're incomplete, they don't say much. It's because they don't know what to say. And I think seeing the multiple choice choices gives them a model that they can use when they need to talk about or write about these ideas. They know that they see the language, they see the format. So I move, then I move and then into the writing section here. Um, I had paraphrasing in, in level one. Now I'm on to mapping. Uh, paraphrase is usually a single paragraph. Now I'm moving to the whole reading. They're drawing a map of the reading that includes all the main points of the reading. So mapping is harder to do than paraphrasing. I might, if I didn't think students know how, you could scaffold it the same way I did paraphrasing. You could give them a partially complete map and have them fill it in and then have them draw their own. Um, but I think if you've taught mapping previously, they should be able to do it. Um, and then for the critical thinking, I'm going to now ask more questions about the issue. I had them examining the issue in level one. Here it's thinking critically about the issue. Um, it's more, my, my questions are more extensive, a few more at least, on the issue. And then on um, the writing of the essays, we're into essays now, not paragraphs. Less personal experience. They're writing about aspects of the reading. Question two asks them to consider the title and, and write about it. Um, they're examining viewpoints in item one. They're addressing a concept, freedom of choice, in item three. Uh, the scaffolding then is moving from the kind of writing, paragraph to essay, from less personal, from personal to less personal, and from uh, concepts and ideas, from um, your own ideas, your th own thoughts and opinions. So now that let's look at level three. My emphasis here is on higher level yet, is on analysis evaluation and response. Um, step one, I'm going to ask the students to list the topic, the topics they predict the readings will be about. I'm having them write. Um, they should at this level be able to, they, we need to move them to independence so that when they pick out a reading, when they don't have us, ar up, up us around anymore, they know that to preview and stop and think, what am I going to expect in this reading? So I want them to write. I did the same, I added a step three here too. Uh, I want them now to start highlighting and annotating as they read. Um, you could move that. You could start at level two if your students were ready. That's why these levels are so arbitrary. It, you might, for one class, you might add step three. For another class, you might not. Uh, you might add it for sooner for one class and not another. Uh, it's just a matter of knowing the students. So they're writing their own predictions here, and then they're starting to highlight and annotate. Reading tip I left the same. Um, now when we get down to vocabulary, sorry students, no more help, multiple choice is gone, write your own sentence defining the word. And again, though, it's not these words that are so important, it's how they can find the meaning of the word in the context, or if they have to, through a dictionary. I left word parks as is, um, that you could convert to, it's hard to convert that to writing a sentence, unless you just have them write their own sentence using the word antipsychotic. That would be one option. Um, the thesis and main ideas. Uh, here you'll see that I took out uh, topic sentences. Topics are gone. I don't think we need that anymore at this level. If they should be able to do that by now, and they need to focus on the bigger ideas, the thesis and implied main ideas. The details, as, you, as you'll see, uh, no more multiple choice. Write your own sentence completing it. Open-ended is, is more difficult. More writing is required. And again, if you wanted to put this into level two, you could. Uh, I put it in three. Uh, part D, the methods. Um, I left that the same. It's really hard to ask them one question to write a sentence telling what the the organizational pattern is, I think that they, they will get lost even at this level. And thinking visually, I changed that. 
I was, there is a reading, there is a photo with the reading. This one I changed to make them think of if there weren't a reading, what reading would you put in? And then show me what section of the reading it illustrates. Again, it's a different type of thinking. It's a more creative thinking. Uh, it's, it's moving them from, again, literal to more critical and, and reasoning skills. I left the um, implied main, main ideas as they are, because it's very hard to get at them any other way. Uh, Jill and I played with this. Uh, various other consultants that I've worked with have played with this. We just can't quite get beyond it. So if any of you know how to get beyond this, I'd love to hear that from you. Um, and thinking critically again, notice multiple choice is gone. Uh, some of the same questions that I kept here, but they have to write their own uh, answer. And I hope they're ready by then after they've seen my modeling through level one, through level two. They, I think they're better prepared to answer them on their own. And then we're ready for uh, response to reading. Here I put in a summary. It's, I think, the harder of the th hardest of the three, paraphrasing, mapping, and summarizing. Uh, it's, a, it's the higher level skill of the three uh, because it, it requires pulling ideas together. I don't think this is a, a skill, Kathleen, that you would teach like paraphrase, where you would provide examples, you provide guidelines, and then maybe you know, a partially completed summary, you would scaffold it. I mean, we're just showing parts of a scaffolding process. Mm -hmm. So you would scaffold teaching summary just like you um, scaffolded teaching paraphrasing. Yes, I think you're right. Either you've taught it before or you need to do it while you're using the reading. Uh, analyzing the issue, I've added, it's more complex now. I've added, I want them to, to look more closely at the reading, to examine it, to evaluate it, analyze it timeliness, evidence, and then in question five there, what I'm doing is moving them to a difficult task. Uh, instead of uh, thinking just about this reading, I place it within the context of a chapter on a topic of conformity and nonconformity, and I'm extending their thinking beyond this reading to related ideas and a larger issue of conformity versus nonconformity. So, I've taken them here to, I think, the furthest we can away from the reading and still be uh, focused with, with the reading but using it in a, in, a, in a brand new way. And then the essays. Um, here I moved to high stakes writing, uh, producing a documented paper. Uh, the students here need to research, uh, use MLA in text citations, prepare the entire thing. Again, of course, this would have to be scaffolded too. And I can't show you everything on the screen here. If they've never done it before, of course, I would give them a source and say, let's just use one source. Let's see how you build that into a paper. Okay, show me how you would include a citation. Show me how you would put it in the works, works cited page. So I would progress through this as well, but this is the end result of level three. Well, that concludes my demonstration. I, I hope I've shown you a creative way to take any reading you want to teach and create either your own set of apparatus for whatever class you're, you're working with, or perhaps I've shown you how to take any reading from any reading and writing textbook, pick the reading, and choose and adapt the questions to make them work for your particular class. Well, thank you so much for listening, and I'd love to hear uh, your questions now. All right. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, while we're waiting for questions, Jill, is there anything you'd like to elaborate on? Um, I think Kathleen's done a great job of sort of covering the bases. It, it is, I mean, this is something we've been, the two of us have been talking about for a long time, is how do you teach student skills in an uh, ongoing way that will help them develop the basic skills they need to build up to the more complicated uh, skills they're going to need to use to be successful in college. And how do you do that using a variety of readings from different topics, maybe different themes that would engage students? So, it, And as, I think the main thing that Kathleen said that stands out for me is that it's you're always trying to decide what's going to work best for the classroom that you have. She's given an example of three levels that you could use 
with one reading as the base basis. Obviously, it could be three different readings because, as she said, the point is not that reading per se. It's how do you help students learn skills they can use and apply to any reading in any situation when there aren't questions and there isn't a teacher to ask. Um, so this is one way to look at it. This is one way to scaffold it. But I think it depends on your classroom. And as everybody on the call probably knows, you're, you might have the same uh, class level or course number, but each semester the, the students in it are completely different. And the classroom has a different makeup. So as Kathleen said a number of times during the presentation, you would change your questions depending on that group. So you might start at a very basic level with one group and only get to the second level. Whereas with another group, you might start at the second level and progress rapidly to the third level. OK, thanks. We do have one question. Um, do you ever interchange the levels based on student needs? So for example, would you ask students questions from both level one and level two? Oh, I think so. Yeah, especially if you've got a class where you've got some level one students and some level two. Uh, as I said, we don't want to leave anybody behind, and we don't want to uh, overlook anybody. And so, yes, you, I would blend, I would mix and match this any way I had to, to meet my students' interests and needs. Okay, thank you. We have one more question. Um, I also stress the process of writing, but I still get arguing from some that want to jump to the final step. How do you deal with this? I'm not sure I understand exactly. How, can you read, 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 read? Uh, I'll try to interpret it. In, essentially, instead of working through the scaffolding, um, they want to just jump to level three and uh, not make the steps necessary. Oh, I see. They, they, they want to get. They want to get. They just want to get the writing done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, again, I think that the students need to understand that we don't really care that they they write about this particular paragraph. What we really care about is that they learn a process, and so that when they get in. Uh, in their next English class, or they're in psychology and they're supposed to write a paper, um, they know how to do it. Or from the reading point of view, they have to be able to read it first and understand it before you can write about it. Uh, I don't know how to lock them out from going there. I think it's more of getting them to buy in to, you know, we're really here to learn how, not what. And that paragraph you write at the end isn't what I'm here to teach you. Uh, as much as I'm teaching you how to find the ideas, how to organize your ideas, what you say in that paragraph doesn't so much matter as as it does how you got there. And if, I try to get them to buy into that, but it's hard. Could the person who gave us the question uh, maybe clarify it a little bit further, Jen, so that we know exactly? Because I'm not clear whether it's the, they're saying the students don't want to do the work or whether the professor would prefer to have a way to get to level three immediately. Oh. Okay, so we'll wait for that to come in. We did have another question, um, and this instructor says, this is interesting. I'm wondering what led to the approach of using multiple choice and true and false in teaching integrated reading and writing? Um, I, I like to, to start with multiple choice and true false because it gives the students the most help. Multiple choice is simply recognition of the right answer among Four. It's there. Your job is to find it. That is easier than it is to say, OK, tell me the main idea of paragraph 16. That requires more complex thinking. I want to move, I want to give students the most help at the beginning and move them to doing it themselves. So I find that in the same is true, true, false. The answer is either right or wrong. And it's only two choices. And that's a lot of easy, a much easier cognitive task than uh, it's hard to ask, it's hard to ask to ask the question any other way too. Is it true or is it not true that? And then the answer is yes or no. So you can if you want to ask that kind of information, you don't really get very far no matter what you do with it. Uh, but I like to move from giving them the most help I can, and I also think that students are used to multiple choice. They've they've taken tests with it, and so let's start with it because they're familiar with it and then let's move them to the less familiar uh, right for me about this. Jill, can you add to that? Yes, I mean, I guess I, mean, uh, 
I wish we could dialogue here with the person asking the question because I know there are concerns about multiple choice mm -hmm. because it is such a literal level of comprehension that you're just asking someone basically to recognize the correct answer, which does require a little bit of thinking. Hopefully they've read the reading and they're recognizing the right answer because they've read it, but also they could obviously do it through a process of um, elimination. But I think what Kathleen's saying is that initially you want to provide support. Maybe these are students who have not been successful in reading before. Presumably they haven't been or they wouldn't be in a developmental reading class. This is the format they're used to and it's a way to start the process of getting them engaged with thinking about the reading. So it's a simpler uh, method of, of helping students to begin to think about how to find the answers they need to from a reading for whatever the purpose is. Uh, what's really important, I think, is that we move away across, this, across the levels increasingly towards, and, and what we're not talking about here is you wouldn't just have a reading or three readings in a row with apparatus set up the way that we're saying here, apparatus meaning the exercises and activities. Obviously, you as the teacher are in the classroom teaching these different skills to students so that between their reading um, an entry level or a low level reading at the beginning of the class, where they're answering true, false, and multiple choice. By the end, they're reading higher level, more complex readings, and there's been you know, many classroom sessions talking about and demonstrating and practicing, summarizing and paraphrasing and all the different skills. So there's a whole piece that we're not discussing here, which is happening in the classroom, which is building student skills so that at the end, they can, you can ask a question and have an open-ended response because the, child, the student has learned what the skills are, knows how to apply them, what the right skills are for that particular reading challenge at that time and can produce a coherent uh, written answer. I also think that with, with multiple choice, I don't stop with, yes, you're right, the answer is C. What I do is say, how do you know that? Find the evidence in the paragraph that, that suggests that that is an opinion, not a uh, fact or why that is the topic sentence and not the other choices. So I use it to teach. Okay, we got a little bit of clarification on the um, the writing process question um, mm -hmm. and the, this uh, instructor mentioned that um, they do stress that students write in steps like the writing process and that's where the majority of her grading is focused. Uh, but for example, she assigned a video tutorial and had workshops in script and storyboarding, but a small number of students just wanted to grab a camera and, t and tape the end product, which is what they seem to do with their papers as well. Um, and in spite of it only being fourth of the grade, the students still wanted to just get the final product done. What do you do to address that, to emphasize the process? I think I'd lock them out of the of the writing. I'd make the writing contingent upon seeing the video tutorial in some way. And I can only go so far, I think, in, in motivating, is what I earlier suggested, in understanding why you need to do it. I guess you have to lock them out of being able to pr produce the final product until they've gone through your steps. It sounds well, hard and, and cold, but <laughs> I guess it's practical. Well, Kathleen, I guess, I guess also some of it would be, I mean, I think it's a real problem because you're going to have some students who probably can just do the final product, but you're going to have a lot of students who can't. So maybe it has to be contingent on their doing, if it's a writing pro process as opposed to a video process, they have to turn in their brainstorming and uh, mm -hmm. first draft and all the, the, the process steps show that they've actually completed those steps before they turn over a finished piece of writing. What do you think? Mm -hmm. that's, that's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. All right. Do we have any other questions? All right, I want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, we really do appreciate your attention throughout the entire day, for those of you who are on with us all day. And thank you, Kathleen and Jill, for your presentation. Um,
Kathleen's materials um, will be available on our Pearson English Pedagogy and Practice um, website as well as the recording from this session. Um, please check that out later next week. And if you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, Steve will put my information up here in just a minute for you guys. And I just want to say thank you once again. We appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank you.